back in the uh, Iron Size podcast at the Venetian Hotel. It's SHOT Show 2024. I got Sam Houston in the house. You sure do. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be fun. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. I haven't, uh, I saw, I've had a couple of interactions with you. I actually met you here last year yep. at SHOT Show. That was my first introduction. And I think by, def- by I think by, by default, we'll end up talking about the guys that introduced mm-hmm. me to you. I've known about you for a long time and I can get into that. Um, then I went out uh, to a range day back east in Georgia. You were teaching, I, I, I was taking Don Edwards' class, the Green Line class, while you were teaching. Uh, I believe what that was, was um, it was like a positional shooting. Yeah, it's unconventional uh, rifle positions. It's like yoga with your AR-15. Yeah. And if you're not flexible, you'll you'll figure it out real quick. Yeah, I probably would have been, that would have been a mess. I, 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 <laughs> believe it or not, like I, I, even guys who have like, you know, infirmity, sports injuries, I'll, I'll usually find a technique that works for them. Yeah. And it might not be optimal, but you know, we've never had somebody just like keel over dead. And, and not be able to in, do it. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, I tell you what, 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 what was happening was, was I was watching all those folks come out of that class at the end of the day and they were dirty which was cool. Uh, a little bit. Everybody's rolling around in the dirt. Yeah. So, uh, fun times. But anyhow, yeah, like that's our, that's my experience with you. And then I've spent some time on the range talking to you through that week. And well, I was supposed to meet up with Don that week for a podcast, which we were able to do the other day finally. And this is awesome because I'm, we're finally, I'm finally getting work done with you guys that I wanted to get done a long time ago. So I am, I'm stoked to be here, man. Thanks for taking time out of your day. Hey man, happy to be here. Thanks for thanks for having me on. And it kind of feels like it's been a long time coming, sort of. But mm-hmm. you know, things happen, and we've had to push things aside. But you know, that's life. Yeah, exactly. And I think that you know, when I look at long time coming, when I kind of stepped into the genre or the space with my training, it was long before the podcast I mm-hmm. uh, got started. We're not too long before. Uh, there were there were guys that I was trying to to understand what direction they were coming from, and and you know, there's a lot to know, and there's it was a little intimidating and a little bit overwhelming. But I was just kind of watching who was contributing what message, and then what information uh, specifically to kind of like their I, I don't know I don't want to call it a niche, but what they really loved to talking about, mm-hmm. right? And so uh, one of the things that came up for me right away was the whole concept of night vision, and I, I didn't realize at the time how many civilians. Uh, actually had night vision at the time and you and also obviously law enforcement mill and all that kind of stuff so um, but you popped up right away for me and that said I, I guess the, the right term for that is the SME of the subject matter expert on that that's what I gravitated towards and then obviously you start to make or connect the dots to who you're connected with and it's not just night vision but it's something sure. that you spent a lot of time around so uh, that's kind of was my like introduction to you um, But also, this is a guy that doesn't just talk about night vision. He trains a lot. Like, there's a lot of classes. There's a lot of shooting this guy is doing. And that intrigued me as well. So, I mean, I want to jump into all that today and kind of talk about the things that you're doing and the things that you've done. But Sure. um, How many podcasts have you done? Not maybe two other podcasts. Like, I think I did... uh, I think I was with John Faulkner doing a, a okay. Firearms Depot one one time, okay. and John's an old buddy, great guy. And then that's that's about it, man. So yeah, good. Very I, very limited. I met John the other night, actually. Yeah, uh, interesting guy. Very yep. interesting guy. Big brain. Big brain on that dude. He has he he is probably one of the most influential people that you've never heard of. Right. But if you know, you know, kind of deal. Yep. So like he, if people don't know, he built what is big daddy unlimited and got it to where it is. Um, and then some things happened and then he was like, okay, well I'm just going to start my own thing. And now he's got firearms depot right. and he's crushing it with this. And then he's also got another business, which I find pretty interesting. They build these custom gun safes. Did he talk to you about that? No, no, we didn't oh, get into that. It was a my, brief meeting. It was I'm not even, it, custom gun safes. Think, think John wick. Yeah. Stuff, okay. Because, because that's what he does and has done. And he builds them for celebrities and, I mean, these things are works of art, and I would recommend you, you I have to go check go this out. see these things. They'll blow your mind. Yeah, just get uh, the mind water, wa- mouth watering and the uh, the eyes googling. It's just more crap I don't need, but yeah, by God, but I you want can appreciate it. it. Oh yes. yeah, yeah, I get it. Um, well, the reason I asked that is 
you know, again, what I found and learned about you is just in the conversations that we've had and, and from other people and kind of taking things in. But uh, here's the, here's what I get about you. You're not a guy, you're kind of a man of few words, but when you are talking, like it is very much calculated and very specific and that I appreciate in terms of the message delivery. And that's what I was talking about before. Here's the information. Here's how you deliver that message. And uh, it's very to the point. And I needed that, right? Sure. With all of the stuff out there. Like I needed like, okay, just give me the meat and potatoes because that's all I have the bandwidth to understand right now. I'm, I'm drinking through a fire hose. But then I heard, I heard you talk about other things where you were going down into a rabbit hole. And I was just like, okay, well, as I start to understand this more, I need to come back and, and talk to Sam. Sure. And, uh, the, you know, in a world, again, going back to, I don't want to make this all about MVGs, but that uh, has evolved at the at the velocity and trajectory that it's evolved, um, you, you're, you're my guy. So <laughs> that said, I also, having only done one, or you only doing one podcast, I don't know a ton about you. I know a little bit about your military career. And one of the other things I know that I want to get into today is that you teach with multiple companies, yep, which is unheard of, uh, more or less. Yeah. I don't know so. if it's unheard of, but it's not, it definitely is not the norm. You yep. know? So, yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. But there's a, there's some detail there I want to dig into sure. in terms of balancing and managing and cultures and, you know, and all oh, yeah. that stuff, because you've been very successful with it, uh, you know, at a high level. So anyway, dude, let's do this. I'm going to, I'd like to, to just hear about kind of where you come from and how you got to here today. Uh, this is my typical podcast line. That sure. is, you get to start wherever you want uh, and finish wherever you want. You just have to be patient because I might time you out to get a little bit more detail. Sure. Ready, set, go. All right. Well, uh, I guess uh, I'm not a special snowflake in, in, or, or I don't have like a, a, a real unique story. Typical angry teenager, okay. right? Um, not a good student in school barely passed high school. Um, but I fortunately had a couple of people in my life. Hey, they were like, you need to get your shit together and at least pass high school and then we'll take it from there. Mm -hmm. And then, Oh, by the way, what are you going to do after high school? And I was like, Oh, you know, I was way into music. So I was like, I want to play guitar oh, really? in a band. Okay. Yeah. Not, not, not too many people know, but I, I do still dabble in guitar here and there. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and they were like, you know, I'm from Austin, Texas, the live music capital of the world. Okay. You can't throw a brick down the street without hitting a guitar yeah, player. It's, it's so a, they they were like, but seriously, what are you going to do? I was like, I don't know. They were like, you should probably think about looking into the military. And I had some family friends and that were in the military and they kind of gave me some guidance. And mm -hmm. then, uh, oh, by the way, I'm not ashamed to admit this at all. I saw Top Gun. Yeah. And... I, I was like, I, w I walked into that recruiting station and I was like, man, I want to fly an F-14 Tomcat. Yeah. Right. And that recruiter looked right at me. He said, absolutely not. You don't have a college degree. <laughs> right. And I was like, oh, well, I'll take the next best thing you got. And they're like, well, you, we got this air crew program. And it sounded interesting. I uh, actually, I originally joined up to be a helicopter rescue swimmer. Um, okay. But I actually joined up right around 9-11, just prior to it. So there was this massive influx of people. And I wasn't, con I was contracted air crew. I was not contracted to get that. You had to volunteer for it. Well, they weren't taking volunteers at the time. And they were like, you're going to go be a fixed wing air crewman. And at the time, I was like, oh, that sounds stupid and it sucks. Um, looking back on it, it was, it was a way better move. Like it, it. How, why? How come? It, um, it set me up for success in what I do in a lot of ways. It gave me a much more technical Okay. Background, and we'll get into that, especially with the night vision and, and, and yep. building and all that stuff. But uh, it, I definitely became more of a, a technical expert and jack of all trades. Um, and I and I got to travel. I mean, I went to like fifty six different countries in about ten years. Um, I amassed a, just a you know a pretty sizable amount of flight hours. I got to see some stuff. I got to participate in some stuff that happened around the globe. That like our community, um, the uh, the P three you know um, Orion P three Orion uh, VP community is it's not really talked about. We we're very happy to kind of just you know hang out and behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. and it's like we're there. But you don't necessarily hear about us, and Just we're totally coming in and coming coming back. Yeah, coming we're like kind of the back. opposite of like Navy SEALs. We don't we don't write books and and talk about our things and like you know, there, it's not televised, it's not talked about, but it is it is a 
a, a pretty critical uh, cog in the in the machine a lot of times. So let me time so, you out here because so I grew up in San Jose, California, Moffett Field. Moffett. Oh yeah. Was it was a major hub for this. Uh, they've since stopped flying through there, but my my entire childhood growing up, that flight path was right over the top of the house. Yep. My dad worked for like 25 years at Lockheed Martin right next door yep. and I did a lot of work at Moffitt. So uh, it's interesting. We were, Cece and I got out of the, um, got out of the airport. We, were, we flew to Hawaii one time. The Uber driver was a pilot yeah. uh, for a P3. P, and, and I'd never talked to anybody that had done this before. Right. Anyway, the point, the, my question in all this is, is can you talk a little bit about what that, sure. what that job was and I mean, we were talking about like there's some pretty interesting things. We don't really talk about it. Can we talk about it? Yeah, we can talk about it. Yeah. What What was the job? So my job on the aircraft was uh, uh, my primary job was in flight technician, and people are like, "Oh, what's that?" And I'm basically like, "It's kind of like um, Geek Squad <laughs> okay. in, in the air." Um, and the plane is so old; it's, it's just a piece of shit. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not a piece of shit, but um, things it's, break. It's in problematic, yeah, yeah. How old it is, yeah. And and they had basically stationed onboard maintenance to fly around with the plane and kick boxes and reseat cannon plugs and you know change cards out and you know take the Nintendo game and blow out the yeah. cartridge. I mean, <laughs> uh, no bullshit. Like I, I have, we did that stuff because the thing's all analog, you know. Uh, right. or, or, or a vast majority of it. And so I, I, I'm, I'm joking, but I'm not joking because I, I have blown cards off and reseated them in <laughs> such a way, just like the old Nintendo game. I mean, and that's the technique they taught. They were like, oh, if this happens, you do the old Nintendo just trick. knock it twice, blow once, right. good. Yeah. And I'm like, are you serious? They're like, yeah, trust me, 50% of the time it works every time. And, you know, <laughs> but uh, additionally, I was an in-flight ordinance man. So uh, yeah. launching sauna buoys and smokes and, and, and um, other devices, free falling stuff. And, you know, and that, that played into the anti-submarine warfare of peace. Um, this is surveillance. So the plane, detection. the plane is kind of your Jack of all trades aircraft in the Navy or was when I was doing it. Now it's the P eight Poseidon. It's an even more, you know, high speed whiz bang aircraft, like way better processing power. But, um, the P three had multiple sensors so we could go over the water. We could, you know, track surface ships. We could track submarines, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, um, uh, find, fix, and, and destroy if need be kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. um, we could go overland and do surveillance. We had um, basically, uh, it, was a, it was an APS-37, but it was a, a synthetic aperture radar. So we could do 3D mapping. and Oh, cool. And, and, oh, yeah. yeah. We had inverse synthetic aperture radar. So basically what it, you, you blast the radar wave out there. And if the ship is moving, it'll build like this 3D image of the ship. So you can actually start to tell what kind of ship it is from, you know, I don't know, hundred miles out, way. depending on the grazing angle and huh. everything like that. And then the, the synthetic will build like a, a 2D a model. map model. Um, and it was, it was really. Fan that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And it was even back then, this was 20 years ago. It was really good. Yeah. And I can only imagine what it is today, but you know, I could, I could be 30 miles away from your house mm. and I could, you know, if I got good, resol good enough resolution, I could synthetic aperture radar your, block where you live and i could tell if your car's in the driveway or not mm. um i could tell you know if your trees need to be trimmed or you know wow. it, it was it was pretty cool like we could we could we could see some things that you wouldn't necessarily see and we use that to great effect we could fly off you know uh, enemy i say enemy but uh, country's coastlines we'd have to, we didn't have to see it we could just 3D print and be like, oh, yep, that ship's in port or the submarine's gone. It must be out to sea. Mm -hmm. uh, or, hey, they're moving trucks to this, you know, vehicle yard or, or whatever, you know, any, anything you can think of. Um, and it wasn't just all military stuff. We did, we did a whole lot of like uh, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief oh, stuff. Oh, nice. Um, That's cool. If you remember back in 2004, 2005, um, this was like the big thing that I did in my career uh, in the Navy that was, it was, or the first big thing, uh, the tsunami. Yes. The Asian tsunami killed yes. over a quarter million people. Um, I was in Okinawa at the time. They were right there. And uh, they came in and we were all, you know, hanging out. You know, it was kind of after the work day, we were all hanging out. They bring in a barrack the, into the barracks and they were like, hey, all air crew, go pack a bag. Something's happened. You're going into crew rest right now. Be prepared to kick out to the airfield, get on a plane and, and fly out in eight hours. And, uh, they didn't really tell us much because they probably didn't, didn't have yeah. that much information. So anyways, we, we take off and they're like, you know, head Southwest. 
So we start heading southwest from Okinawa. And in flight, we get, you know, tasking. They're like, some planes are going to Diego Garcia. Some planes are going to Utapau, Thailand. Um, and this is what's happened. There's been a tsunami. It's really bad. We don't necessarily know what we're getting into. You're going to be first eyes on because of your, wow. in, you know, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance um, uh, capabilities. Mm-hmm. So we land in Utapau, but it was kind of rabbit hole side story. They were like on the flight in, they were like, has anybody ever been to Thailand? Cause they didn't know what they were getting into. And I'm, I'm like, I'm not the junior guy on the crew, but I think I'm the next, like I'm almost the, junior the, guy. Almost, at the bottom. almost at the bottom of the pecking order. I was like an E4. And I was like, I've been to Thailand. They're like, bullshit. I was like, no, actually I was here like five years ago when I was, you know, you know, 16 years old. My, they were like, what? And I was like, my uncle lived here. Okay. And he was helping the Thai government set up their nuclear reactor. He's an engineer. And we went over for two weeks to visit him. They're like, have you been to this area? I was like, as a matter of fact, I have. They're like, well, guess what? Petty officer Houston, you are going to be like the liaison between any Thai government Just entity. Just like that. Uh, slash tour guide slash interpreter. They were like, do you speak Thai? I was like, I know how to say four things in Thai. They were like, you know the most amount of Thai. It's like uh, Brad Pitt in, in, in Glorious Bastards, you know? Uh, so, so there, it was, but so we, where we land and, and, and they put us up in a, in a hotel. It was pretty nice. And it was, I mean, it was like the typical Navy experience. We, we were flying these crazy missions during the day, you know, trying to locate survivors, you know, see what infrastructure's left, vectoring helicopters and other uh, assets into airfields to deliver aid and relief. Um, and then we go back and party our ass off mm-hmm. in, you know, uh, 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 where were we? Um, Walking Street in Patia Beach. And, you know, if you've been to Patia Beach, you know, and uh, all those stories you hear, they're true. They're they're all true. Hundred percent true. Some. And I'm twenty year old single dude in right. the navy, and I'm going nuts. Yep. And I've been there before, so like I know the lay of the land. And I'm taking everybody to these restaurants, and like we all got these really nice custom tailored silk suits, and just it was, you know, <laughs> Having the time of your life. Yeah, partying with girls in the yeah. bars right. and watching the the Thai, the Muay Thai fights, and just it was. I was there for like thirty or forty days. Uh, plus, we were making a little bit of money in per diem, so like I wasn't coming out of pocket. I was actually probably making money, and it was it was awesome. It was just sounds like a good time. It was a good time. I mean, it was a good Obviously. time. But then you'd go out on these missions, and and it looked like the hand of God just came in and just <clears throat> nothing. Yeah. It looked like a bomb went off, and there's you know there's bodies everywhere. Crazy. It was it was bad. But I, I just saw a clip of that the other day. Just with that, there's a couple of like. I guess famous clips where that this this huge wall of water just washing across the farmland. Yep, there, and, and it's miles inland, mm-hmm. and there's boats and ships and stuff. It was that was really tough to look at. We flew as far west as Sri Lanka, um, and flew around there until they launched fighter jets on us and tried to oh. you know shoot us down. So we had to we had to kick out and, Time and, to go. and run Check, away. Please. Yep. yep. Uh, we flew over the Nicobar and the Maldives Islands. We flew over Banda Aceh, Indonesia, and then, you know, uh, Phuket, Thailand. And I mean, it was, it was bad. We also took the liberty of um, doing quite a bit of intelligence collecting on the Indonesians. Because you were over there. Because we were over there. Um, we, you know, we didn't necessarily know a whole lot of what they, capabilities wise, because we don't, I mean, right. we, we have no real. Why would we worry about it? Right. But we, it was, it was interesting. Uh, we were. We were taking photos of Indonesian patrol vessels and, and, and surface combatants and, you know, and we had this system called Pioneer and we were, uh, it was very, very, very rudimentary early on stuff. We were able to take still photos and beam them up via satellite to a, a ground control station. And okay. we were told at the time, I don't know if this is true or bullshit, or maybe they told us this to, you know, keep our morale up or whatever, but they were like, yeah, you're beaming it right into the White House. Oh, like geez. the Oval Office is seeing what you're doing. We're that's, like, whoa, that's something. Shit, you know. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of cool. Um, anyway, did what we could over there. Mm-hmm. Kicked back to Okinawa. Kept flying. Um, every once we'd go. This was when uh, this was you know the GWAT was was happening. And so I was going to ask you. Yeah, what, a lot so- of people don't don't. Well, I mean, some people don't know. Um, the GWAT encompassed the globe, right? So it wasn't just Afghanistan. Um, we had some stuff going on in the Philippines. There was a terrorist group called Abu Sayyaf. They were 
you know, they were Islamic State, Al Qaeda affiliated, uh, Islamic State after a while, Al Qaeda affiliated um, in the beginning. And they were bad dudes. And we were going down there and we were, you know, trying to track them in the jungles. We had, we were picking up Green Berets and having them ride along with us um, to help us, you know, tell us what to look at. And there were ground teams on the ground. We were landing in, you know, these austere um, environments. Uh, uh, yeah, airfields. And, you know, the Marines had come out and surround the airplane and, you know, face out and pull security for us while we fueled up. We had to, um, you know, we didn't ever get shot at, right. but, you know, P3 is a national asset to a certain extent. So they wanted to protect it. So mm-hmm. we were never, we were like, okay, I guess we're going to go in. Um, but we flew over Zamboanga and all the, the islands down there where Abu Sayyaf was. And then additionally, we, we have routine patrols off the coast of China mm-hmm. where we were doing, um, these flights, uh, you know, if you've paid attention to the news, you know, oh, the, the Chinese are intercepting. We, we got intercepted damn near every time we flew off of China. Mm-hmm. Um, went to South Korea, did some some exercises with the South Koreans, may or may not have looked into North Korea just right. to kind of monitor their stuff. Um, and, you know, was in northern Japan, which is really beautiful. If you've never been up there, like the cherry blossoms and stuff, it's it's pretty. Was down in Okinawa, so you're you're kind of... You know, you, you think back to World War Two and what those guys had to do to take that yeah. island. And it's, you know. I was inspired um, last, it was actually Halloween. I was out to New Orleans, nice. Louisiana. Great museum, uh, isn't it? I just, um, it was mind-blowing. It, it, it's, it's might, it's the best World War Two museum I've ever been to. Uh, it was it's mind-blowing. the top five museums I've ever been to. So, yeah, if you're in New Orleans, definitely make a day. Yeah, I, let me put a plug in for that, too. Just like the. The, the way they put that thing together is outstanding. It's a full experience. Uh, and I was refreshed on a lot of things that I may have forgotten or, you know, it was a little bit vague on. I learned a lot of new things. And one of the things that I realized I, I just didn't know that much about were all the things that were going on in the South Pacific during that time. Oh, yeah. How awful the Japanese were being to the, to the Chinese, you know, what was going on on all those islands down there and, and how that was spreading. And it was basically going unchecked for a long time so that when those when US service members got down there it was yeah. brutal. I mean just the rape in Nanjing, they killed like what 300,000 Chinese in Wild. like a week, Wild. you know. Yeah. And that was just one incident. So yeah. yeah. I yeah. I do worry though. Why would you put it in New Orleans if a hurricane comes yeah, through? I know, right? It's going to wreck all that history. I I, I got to tell you why. Because this is my my theory on that. My theory is is they got to have something down there outside of Bourbon Street cuz that place is a mess. Eh, it's true. neat like we saw it uh the architecture down there, all the history down there. I mean, Food. It's, a, it's a, yes, it's a 300 year old city, but yeah, every 15 years, that whole place is underwater. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so that's a, that's, that's a thing I think. Um, but it's a jewel. It yeah, is, yeah. it is a jewel. But uh, yeah. So for anybody listening, if you go to go to New Orleans, it don't, don't think you're going to go spend two hours there. New. Dude, I, it's we were all day there. thing. We were there all day. We probably could have spent another I was day. Saying, I could go back a second day. For yeah, sure. for sure. Yeah. Anyways. Um, yeah. Okay. So very cool. So you're seeing, you're seeing, you know, there's a lot of nostalgia there, right? There's yeah. a lot of, you're seeing a lot of stuff. And and that was just the first like deployment. And then the next deployment was, was like, we're going to the desert. Right. Uh, so I got the yin and the yang. Like I got my, you know, Westpac kind of, I say party um, deployment. And then the next one was like, Hey, we're living in tents in the desert. You know, it wasn't that austere. I've done, you know, further in my career, we were like, we were not in Indian country, but, um, it was definitely not Westpac, you know, we're not going to a hotel or anything like that. You're, sure. you're, you're living in a hooch and then you're flying into Iraq or, you know, over the, uh, the Arabian Gulf or, or whatever spying on Iran, mm-hmm. um, or flying overland Iraq or something like that. Uh, and it was, I mean, that's the first time like I ever got rocketed. Uh, um, oh really? Yeah. Uh, that was, I got, I've got, I don't want to like, this will, this podcast will be too long if I tell like war stories and my war stories yeah. aren't like, Oh, I shot this dude. Up. Yeah, my war no. stories are we funny. We don't have to get into all of that. They're, right? but. they're funny. They, they involve like, you know, farting and, and yeah, you know, gotcha. just that stuff. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Iraq was interesting. I mean, we were flying and looking for dudes, planting IEDs in the road, um, mm-hmm. covering convoys. And we, we were flying this really, really top secret mission that uh, we can talk about now, but, 
I got a TSSEI clearance and like, it was like, you got read into this program to enter the building. It, it had like the men in black retinal scanner and the door goes, and it's like a, it's a skiff and, and all this stuff. But basically it had this, this function where we could, it was a moving target indicator. You could track all these moving targets on a gr- on the ground. Okay. And then what they would do is they'd overlay where the IED strikes happened okay. the day prior. And they would see what vehicles the patterns, went yeah. to that thing. And then they would back backtrack track where those vehicles originated okay. from. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I work with dudes who are, you know, special operations guys. So what I was doing was going directly to like fusion cells and they were disseminating that information to these guys. And I heard it was only about a four hour turnaround time. It's like a target they, package. That exactly. Fast, yeah. And some of this stuff was time sensitive. So, you know, I've talked to dudes like, like I'm buddies with Kyle Lamb and talking yeah. to him about some of the stuff we were doing. He was like, bro, that we were very much involved in some of the intelligence you were uh, doing and like they, they would go hit these, you know, IED, you know, bomb maker facilities or cache sites or whatever. So it was, that, that was a super rewarding. Yeah, um, I bet. And we, we got briefed by some um, three letter agencies after the um, deployment and they told us what we did. And it was, it was really cool. Like um, just like, I felt like I was making a difference. Yeah. Like you're, you're contributing. Yeah. And, and then kind of the, that's when kind of the music stopped. Um, I did my time in my deploying squadron and then they're like, okay, you have a seashore rotation in the Navy, Mm -hmm. generally speaking. So you do about five years of, you know, deploying and then you do about three or three years of shore duty, they call it. It's usually like instructor duty or a B billet or something like that. And so I was like, well, can I can I kind of do this backdoor thing and go to this other special project squadron to keep deploying? Cause I really enjoy this because the war was in full swing. And I was like, I want to, I want to help. I want to do my, you know, I joined the military to, to deploy and do this thing. I'm single. I'm living out of a bag. I love it. I'm with the best people in the world. This is great. I could keep this up for, I don't, for a long time. Let's, let's keep doing this. And they're like, yeah, we don't really have any spots available in the, in the squadron right now. So, you got to choose something else. So then I, I tried to be a SEER instructor because I went to, through SEER school. Um, again, they didn't have any spots. So they were like, okay, dude, you're either going to Patuxent River, Maryland, which is the, uh, they do all the, like the research and development and test and evaluation for aviation for the Navy there. Okay. Um, there's some interesting stuff going on there, but it's, it, it ain't action packed. Mm-hmm. I just put it to you that way. You don't fly a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, Maryland gun laws suck right. if you don't already know that. <laughs> Um, and you're, you're, you're real close to DC and the flagpole. And it's just, uh, it wasn't my, I was like, nah, I don't want to do that. So they were like, well, you can go to Jacksonville, Florida and be an instructor. So, uh, basically air crew instructor for P3 Orion upgrading, um, you know, non-qual guys. So go down there, um, get instructor qualified. Um, it was uh, side story. Um, I got instructor qualified very quickly and it was, um, like I was like the golden child okay. and I was like, man, I'm just kind of doing my job. Well, the other guy that was upgrading with me <laughs> turned out to be like a, a child molester. Oh, God. <laughs> he got rolled up and, you know, taken to jail and all this stuff, which made me look like the man. Yeah. So, um, I was like, mm, cool, I'll take it, <laughs> right. you know? Um, but, uh, you know, I was flying with students, teaching class, and it was cool because I was flying a lot, but it was routine, like, training missions and stuff like that. And eventually, it kind of, like, you know, you're supposed to have a, an easier work week, basically, when you're on shorty. Now, I was working 50, 60 hours a week. Oh, wow. And, and flying my butt off. And I was like, dude, I want to do something else. So, I made a couple of requests to transfer into some different jobs. Like, I, I applied for the Army Warrant Program to fly helicopters because I actually – was flying helicopters part time. Um, oh, interesting! Just for fun, and uh, the army actually picked me up. They were like, "Absolutely, you're a great candidate. Come on over." Oh, so wow! You, okay, yeah. so there's a transition. Well, I, I mean, they, I knew there was army in here somewhere. Here's but. here's the kicker: the navy was like, "You're in a critically manned, undermanned job. You ain't going nowhere. We're not letting you go. We're not letting you go." So that kind of dashed my dreams. And then I was like, "Okay, well, can I stay in the navy but go to some special programs?" They had some naval special warfare programs. Um, SWIC was, was one I looked into the, you know, the boat crewman stuff and then, uh, some UAV stuff. They were, uh, special activities guys were, were augmenting and, and, um, attaching to enable special warfare teams to give them some ISR stuff. Okay. And I was like, oh, that sounds cool. Um, so applied for that, 
wouldn't wouldn't grant me. Same. Yeah. So I found a loophole in my contract that will, uh, like I was looking through my contract, I was like, oh my God, I can get out in six months. And I went to my chain of command. I was like, hey, I can get out in six months or you can give me orders to this other unit. And they're like, whoa, you have to sign an extension. I was like, I don't have to it sign is. anything. <laughs> right. So either you give me said orders to Wherever. this other place or I'm going to get out. And um, they, 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 they made some veiled threats and, and threatened me with some like – um, demotions and stuff like that. And I was like, I kind of called their bluff. I was like, you can't, I was like, let's go to court martial and we'll see how this, this, how this works out. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they knew they, uh, they were like, oh shit, call her bluff. So, yeah. And they they backtracked real fast. Uh, but I had a lot of buddies in my, my, my chief at the time, his name's Tom. He, he was a great guy. I liked him. I was like, Hey, I'll make a deal with you. I'm going to get out, but I'll transfer to the reserves and I'll go to the reserve unit within the unit. And when I'm home, I'll do my reserve thing and still fly and teach and stuff like that. Hold on. I'm confused. So you'll get out. You'll go into the reserve unit for the Navy. Yes. Naval Got reserves Got from it. active duty. Got it. Um, in the meantime, I started applying. I had buddies who had gotten out and became contractors overseas. So I called a buddy up. He had like, hey, you should come do this. This was like two years prior to that. So I called him up. I was like, hey, man, is that job offer that, you know, I should come do this still on the table? He's like, absolutely. So I put in a resume. Um for a place called in situ. They, they, they fly the scan Eagle UAVs. I'd hmm. say they fly them. They, they manufacture them there and they fly them. And then they, um, hmm. it was a, at the time it was a really cool UAV. So I'd say it's a lightweight UAV, but not like small quadcopter. Like I mean, yeah. it's a, it's a true, you know, UAV. It's, it was about 50 pounds. Yeah. Um, you launch it off a pneumatic catapult, um, uh, has a really interesting recovery process. It has pretty damn decent optics on it. Uh, there were some, um, Elint or sorry, SIGINT packages you could you could attach to it, and then it had you know for nighttime use we had a, a thermal camera, a daytime use electro optical video. But anyways, I I ended up getting picked up, became a contractor, and from about 2010 till about 2000, the end of 2015, so about six years, I was gone. I mean, I I probably spent eight months, sometimes nine months out of the country. Wow. Um, you and know, where were we? Uh, Middle East? Uh, yeah, most Iraq, Afghanistan. Um, and then, and, and the company was really interesting because at the time, you could be as high speed or low speed as you wanted to be. And so my first deployment was really low speed because I was low on the totem pole, didn't have experience. I basically did perimeter security around a big base, Al-Assad in Iraq. Okay. It, nothing happened right. um, except, you know, decent paychecks were hitting my bank account for the first time. Um, but it was very, you know, not a lot happened is, it's pretty boring. Yeah. So the next one I was like, I want to go to Afghanistan okay. and Afghanistan at the time, this is, you know, 2010, 2011, yeah. you know, stuff was very much happening. I, we, we killed like three people, my very first mission. Wow. And I was like, because well, nothing had happened in Iraq. So this was like, holy shit, we're, we're doing shit. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, we do this just about every day. You know, sometimes three, four times a day. I was like, holy shit, you know, there's, there's a lot of shit going on out here. So did about a, it was like a four month rotation, I think. Um, got some, some uh, experience and they kicked me out into Indian country. So I was living on this like tiny little patrol base. Um, actually it was a fob, but it was, it was way out in Northern Helmand province. And, you know, you're, you know, like, I lived in a, you know, I lived in a, like a Connex a, box or something. Yeah. Basically a Connex box. Um, it wasn't a Connex box. It was actually a wooden shipping container oh God. that I scavenged with another dude. And we built it into like our own housing. Like it, it was wow. pretty cool actually, but, uh, sounds brutal. Uh, no, nah, you know, it was like when you're a kid building forts. Yeah, okay. Gotcha. So, so, you know, no big deal. We were scavenging and scrounging for supplies for like roofing materials and, you know, sandbagging the walls for, you know, mm -hmm. um, protection and whatnot. But it, it ended up being pretty cool. But man, we were, we were squashing dudes like cockroaches out there. Okay. Um, it, in one deployment I did out there, we killed like 500 people in like 
three or four months. Wow. I mean, there were a lot of bad guys, a lot of bad guys. Uh, we were supporting the Marine Corps. So that was down in Hellman. So every single yeah. Marine Corps infantry unit, line unit, we were, we were supporting, supporting them. Mm-hmm. And, and don't get me wrong. The Marines were taking casualties too. It was, it was sad. Um, there was a couple of times, I think it was first battalion, six Marines. They took a, they took an IED blast. Uh, it was a V bed in a market uh, outside of Kajaki and it killed like six Marines, like 30 civilians. Wow. And the, the helicopters, they had a medevac um, dust off uh, helicopter unit at the base. And they took off and they're, they're, they go in and pick up the Marines. And so they, they call for, they were like, hey, we need blood. So I literally put the UAV in an autopilot orbit around the, the, the blast site. And I run down to the shock trauma unit and I'm like, take my blood. So, wow. So you're giving blood to the Marines and then I'm running back and flying the UAV. Hmm. It, it was, I mean, it was fucking real. That's intense. Um, I'm a helping, I'm, out, I'm a contractor, but dude, like they're, they're my guys. Yep. So you're helping, uh, the, the medics like, like pick up gurneys and, and take the dudes into the shock trauma unit. Um, everybody, everybody pulled their weight and then some on the fob. Like it was just what you did. Um, so that, that was a, that was a, we did a lot of work that those deployments in, in Helmand, and that was uh, that was crazy. How how long does the contracting job go for? So I did that for about three and a half years for that particular company, okay. and then on my last Scan Eagle deployment, I was embedded with a an SF ODA third group ODA in um, it was a uh, Capisa province and at Fob Kutzbach, and that was cool. Like I was going, like I went on a few patrols with them. Um, and we got attacked a lot, and I'm like on the the wow. perimeter, like shooting back at dudes. Wow. And I remember this one time, like you know, during an attack, uh, you know, I, I, I'm shooting a muzzle flash about 400 yards away, and I my gun goes dry, and I, I duck down behind the the Hesco to put a new mag in, and like right after I duck down, like the PKM fire came in and kicked up a bunch of dirt and right stuff there. right where I was, right where you were. and I was like, hmm, good timing, maybe. I mean, I was like, that was fucking cool, but I was like, maybe I need to look for another line of work because I had, you know, a fiance and, and, a, and, a, mm-hmm. and a, you know, soon to be stepson at Some the time. Liability like, there. Yeah. It's like, it's not just about having fun and me anymore. Maybe. So my buddy had called me on a satellite phone. He's like, dude, you should come to Africa and work with me in Africa. And I was like, I don't know, man, fucking Afghanistan stuff's kind of cool. I'm making good money. He's like, I'll double your pay. I was like, and you'll live in a nice you know, resort compound in Africa doing some, some stuff. I was like, Oh, I'm a capitalist. <laughs> I like money. <coughs> and, and he was kind of telling me how it was. I was like, that sounds pretty cool. You mean I don't have to like heat a bag of water up and, and right. shower in lukewarm water, right. you know, um, or, or, or wet naps or whatever. I was like, okay. So I, I ended up doing a, a job interview on a sat phone, phone on top of a Hesco barrier in the middle of the night in Afghanistan, got the job, went to my guys. I was like, Hey, I'm giving you my two weeks notice. Um, I was I actually, like, I think I gave him three weeks notice. Cause I knew it would take him some time to get a replacement out to me. Where you were. So I was like, I will do my job until the very end. No problem. They were a little bit pissed. I was like, if Come you on. guys, if you guys doubled your salary, I wouldn't be mad. Right. So anyway, uh, go home. And then go out to Oklahoma, did a little bit of an interview train up thing. Uh, but mostly it was like on the job training. So I, I f- go out to, to Africa and this was like right after, um, I think it was, a it was that Westgate mall thing where Christian Craighead went in and, and oh, did right. his thing. Yes. Um, so Just saw him downstairs yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've heard he's a pretty good dude, but, uh, you know, I had to go through Nairobi, Kenya and, things were great. The security was, was off the, the chart. Like they, they even told me this, they were the, my company's like, don't fly through Kenya. I was like, I have to fly through Kenya to get there unless you want me to wait in Amsterdam for 10 days. I was like, I'll take the risk. And it was crazy. Cause I, I land, I'd never really been to Africa before. And immediately upon landing in Nairobi, I get the full African experience like right there. So it's me, the, the white Mzungu, um, great white hunter. Um, and then there's a, a woman in traditional African garb mm-hmm. right next to me, you know, flashy, you know, yellows and, and reds mm-hmm. and the, the hair stuff. And mm-hmm. I'm like, okay. And then there's a, a dude 
uh, who has a suit that's like three times too big that has clearly been passed down right. generationally, right. but he wears it with pride. Right. And then you've got a dude who's wearing like a man dress who's a shepherd and he has a live goat sitting on his lap in the Nairobi airport. I'm like, you can't make this shit yeah, up. I know. <laughs> so that was, that was crazy. It was, it was, you know, a bit ironic, yeah. but, uh, I was like, Oh, stereotypes, right. so stereotypes exist for a reason. Yeah. Um, and it was uh, anyway, get to, I was flying out of Uganda. So we were based out of Entebbe. And if you're familiar with that, like the, the whole Israeli raid on Entebbe, mm -hmm. like, we were at the hangar that our plane was at was right next to the terminal. So there's like pock marks and gunshots uh, on the on the hangar. Like it's still there. Still there even from the 70s. Yeah. Right? And if you didn't know this, the... the um, Is that 70s or 60s? Uh, 70s. 70s. 79, I believe yeah. it was. The, the Cyrat Macau guys, they like uh, threw grenades down the uh, intakes of all the fighter jets so that the Ugandans wouldn't take off and, and shoot them down. Mm -hmm. So all these fighter jets, they had bulldozed over into a big pile there's a giant pile, pile of, of mig fighter jets off in the off in the corner just you know trash but uh that that movie blood diamond yep you know there's all these scenes in that movie like this is africa man many of those scenes played out time and time again you know over the course of about two two and a half years in africa like it's a different place it's the wild west yeah, and that's it's what i've heard it's it's interesting like in Afghanistan and Iraq, it's like outside the wire. It's like, hey, it, it, it's understood. That's bad guy country. And there's dudes that are going to try to shoot at you possibly or or whatever. And that's just, that's the contract, right? But you can shoot back at them. So, you know, mm -hmm. fair shake. In Africa, you never really knew what you were going to get into. And, you know, one day it would be all good. And the next day they're like, hey, uh, did you hear you know, so-and-so warlord took over this area where that airfield is um, from the other warlord that mm -hmm. we were buddies with. We don't know how it's going to be. Um, oh, by the way, you're going to fly tomorrow and you're going to have to take on gas halfway through your mission at that, at that same air airfield. Board, yeah. um, here's an envelope full of bribe money. Um, Good luck. And, yeah, pretty Good much. Luck. Yeah. And we were, uh, we were flying unarmed. And... I have never wanted a Glock 19 more than any time <laughs> of my life. Not that it would have, like, when they roll up on your aircraft with two technicals. Yeah, that's what she's going to say. Like, oh, 250 cal yeah. strapped to the top. But I'll shoot the one guy. I, guess. Right, I don't yeah. know. But uh, so it was, you, you had to use, like, your your American charisma and, and talk fast. And, Spidey senses. And, yeah, man. But it was cool. Nothing ever weird ever happened. Um, and you'd fly out to, like, a lot of people don't understand how big Africa, Africa is. is. Yeah. And it is the dark continent for a reason. Like you fly over, you'll fly over a thousand miles of jungle before you hit like a road or a town or, or like if, and we had all these like contingency plans. If you were to go down, well, first of all, surviving a crash in the jungle is damn near impossible. Yeah, that's not that's Triple canopy jungle. Uh, and then if you survive, then you've got to, and hopefully you're not, badly injured then you've got to you're not gonna hopefully you don't get eaten by what's exactly out there. um yeah. i watched a leopard stalk a dude down a trail for like three miles he was walking down the trail in the middle of the night he had no idea this and i'm i'm like this dude's gonna get eaten. nature's metal yeah sure. like 100 percent. i'm right. like this is you know faces of death kind of thing he had no idea um but uh we did the 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 joseph coney mission is was that? like um joseph coney was this like far right wing i say right wing but he was like a a crazy christian like he was like the david koresh of africa oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah i yeah. know exactly um, what you're talking about there's a movie on this yeah thing. he he was bad dude um he had like this child army and and um mm -hmm. we we helped track him down we helped the the ground guys get there i think it killed his brother uh I think he got AIDS and ended up dying. Yep. Which AIDS is very prevalent over there. Mm -hmm. um, if you've never been to Africa, like, don't don't mess around in Africa. Yeah. Like, don't just don't. Anyway, um, and then after that mission was complete, they were like, "Hey, you're gonna go to Injamina, Chad. Um, Chad is West Africa, sure. you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, and it's probably the worst place I've ever been to. Um, you know." 
There's not a lot of like working infrastructure there. There's rolling blackouts. It's hot. Uh, if you've ever seen Black Hawk Down, mm-hmm. it looks like the Bacara market everywhere. Wow. I mean, you could have just you could have filmed the sequel there. Not that there was a sequel, but if you needed another suitable location, uh, that would be perfectly acceptable. There was a bunch of suicide bombings when we were there. We had a we were co-located with a, an Army B team, and they came over and did a threat assessment of our compound, and they were like. You got work to do? They were like, well, there's nothing going to happen. They were like, yeah, guys, uh, you're fucked if something <laughs> happens. We're like, yeah, we figured we were. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the assessment. They were like, here's our number. Call us. We'll get over here as fast as we can, but it's going to take us 10, 15 minutes to get here. It's an eternity. Um, which, you know, happened in um, – was that Talk about Molly? That. It was in Molly. Mm-hmm. Um, they 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 came into that hotel and they killed a couple of Americans and some other um, mm-hmm. foreigners. And there was a Kyle Morgan. The Kyle was, Morgan story. He went in and, and did his thing, and mm-hmm. and he was on his own for a long time. And mm-hmm. you know um, that was basically what was going to happen. Uh, so we'd have been we'd have been screwed. We didn't. Yeah. Anyway, but we were doing the, the Boko Haram mission. And that was really cool because we actually worked a lot alongside the French. And the French military, super professional. Uh, one of the best militaries I've ever worked. Oh, interesting. You know, um, we, we had, a, we had a, a 4th of July celebration. There was an army. Uh, the B team was there. And we had some Navy CBs out there and then us contractors. And we had a kind of a compound uh, that we we worked out of. We lived on the other side of town, but we worked out of this compound because it was by the airfield. So we had the, this Fourth of July celebration, and we had the French over because we were like, "Oh, you you helped us in our revolution. Come on over." Mm-hmm. And then we had one British LNO that was there, and man, we fucked with that <laughs> dude so bad. But I got I got shit faced. It was it was a good time that that Fourth of July celebration in Africa, but. Um, you know, the French, we were doing like battle damage assessment and targeting. So we'd go out and find these terrorist training camps, the Boko Haram guys. And then the French would launch two fighter jets, the Rafales, their bomb trucks. Mm-hmm. And they'd just go drop two laser guided bombs on them. And then we'd come back and be like, yep, you're good. You, nothing's alive down there. Good job. Or, hey, you missed. Mm-hmm. Um, you reattack kind of thing. So um, the French were awesome. They were, they were super cool. They never gave us any flack or, or anything like that my french is terrible you know but but they were they were all cool better and, than your tie <sighs> not the same <laughs> i so. think the uh like what i mean what you did right there is you just painted a picture of like a really clear picture of all, being resilient taking advantage of opportunity obviously the work and the the quality of work you were putting in set you up for those opportunities it's interesting to hear about the tech piece. Yeah. Like that kind of, I guess, ties in a lot with, you know, the MVG piece maybe a little bit and sort of the, the yeah. ability to, to to read into that and understand how all that works and what's if, important, what isn't. Yeah. I approach a lot because I'm an aviator at heart. You know, um, I did some ground stuff for sure in the military, but I definitely cut my teeth in aviation. So I approach things from an aviation mindset and I'll, I'll kind of talk about that here in a second. But um after that, uh, kind of the contracts and the war was winding down, and this mm-hmm. is like late 2015, and I ended up getting laid off. Okay. And I could have I could have submitted another resume to another Something contracting else, yeah. company and probably gone somewhere else. But I, I kind of looked at it as like, you know, maybe this is God trying to say, hey, it's time to look for another opportunity. It's time to come home, mm-hmm. right? I had I had basically spent 15 years on the road on the road, living out of a bag overseas. You know, I think I, you know, tallied up, I got like 15, 16 deployments. Hmm. Um, you know, so uh, many, several years of my life gone, Mm -hmm. which, you know, you miss things and you lose relationships and lose touch with people, but I still, I I loved it. I I probably would not have really changed anything. It's a tough trade-off. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, certain dudes are wired a certain way Mm -hmm. to do certain jobs and, for sure and so anyway uh i came back and you know i also was going through a, a pretty rough divorce at the time mm-hmm. and i i was using my gi bill going to school and i hated school mm-hmm. like i'm in, i'm 30 
something, you're 32 years old, and I'm in there with about 18 year olds. Yeah, I can't imagine. And I'm like, these kids are dumb. Yeah, and I, can't, I can't, I can't imagine. I don't know if I can interface with, like, they'd open their mouth, and I'm like, did you just say that? Right. Like, I know you don't, you're not trying to be stupid, but, but damn, kid. Right. Um, and I've, so this is not the first time I've right. heard that. Right? Um, and I will say this to vets transitioning. If you go to school, like if you're 22, if you do one enlistment, and you go to school, it's probably not as big of a deal. They're still, you know, 18 year olds are still in your, um, you know, y- yeah, age range. Yeah, yeah. There's not a big, it's not a huge gap. Yeah. But if you're in your thirties and you're with 18 year olds, like be prepared for a culture shock. Yeah. I was, and it was very hard for me to, I guess, integrate or, or, or transition, uh, from, I say military, I mean, being a contractor, it was almost like being in the military. It, I mean, it's not because I was getting paid right. awesome, but I was still By you know, deploying company. and I'm still doing right. stuff in support of our national interests and whatnot. But, um, the, the college thing was a huge shock. And <laughs> additionally, they're like, Hey, so when's the last time you did math? I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, Oh, like, like algebra. I was like, well, 15, 18 years ago. And so you take like this math assessment and it was like that scene in Forrest Gump yeah. where they're like, Mr. Gump, he's going to have to go to a special school. So I had to go to like remedial algebra, yeah, just, which, you know, I, I did like when I, when I, long story short, I ended up doing a, like a semester and I was like, this is not for me. We're done. But yeah. I had all A's, you know, and I, but I had... I had the work ethic to go to study hall and suffer and, and suffer and, and do remedial or, uh, you know, practice tests and, and work with tutors where I got it. Like, I was like, I can do this <laughs> too much work. Why? Um, yeah. But yeah. And, and at the time, um, when was that? It was about 20, it was about 2016, 2015. Um, I off and on, I had been, in, uh, helping Don Edwards from green line tactical mm-hmm. do, uh, you know, AI. And oh, by the way, all through the, the contracting and the military stuff, I was taking classes and shooting. Um, you know, I was a, very much a student of the gun. I guess I should have mentioned that. Um, I also owned and operated a night vision hog hunting outfitting service um, in the midst of doing the contracting stuff because that was gone for two months, home for two months. Mm-hmm. So for two months, I'd do hog hunts with clients and stuff like that. So I learned a, a, a fair amount about night vision and, mm-hmm. and kind of what to do and what not to do when it came to hunting you know, what worked, what didn't. Um, so I, you know, tromping around the swamps of Florida under night vision is, you know, it's a learning experience. Um, and it was cool, but I also started AI and for Dawn doing, you know, pistol carbine classes and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And when I got out, um, I remember I was, I was hanging out. I got, actually, I got a call from Dawn and I went over to where he was working. He had just been hired by a tactical night vision company mm-hmm. to be the military law enforcement uh, director, I think. And he was like, hey, man, we need somebody to be a part-time builder, night vision builder. Um, and I was like, hell yes. Mm-hmm. Get me out of school. I got, I need something. And I jokingly say I was hired to take out the trash and clean the toilets. And then every once in a while, build a PVS 14. Yep. Cause I was literally taking the trash out and cleaning the toilets because, you know, the other guys in there were, were, were kind of dirty dudes. I was like, let's clean this place up a little bit. Let's, let's make this look a little bit more professional. professional. Yeah. And in the midst of that, you know, I looked for work to do and, you know, I was go getter or whatever. Um, and I worked my way into a full-time position. So I, um, I got hired on full-time. I think that was, that was probably 20, late 2016, maybe okay. something, something like that. Um, maybe 2017, somewhere around there. It all kind of, you know, is a little bit foggy, but I basically ran, managed the build and repair program okay. for TNVC, um, for about eh, two and a half, three years. Yeah, about three years. Um, so, like, if you got a, a night vision system, you touched it. Uh, built between, let's say, 2016 mm. and 2020, something like that. Yeah, I built it more than likely. Um, if you needed a repair done, I, I did that. Um, shipping and receiving, all that stuff. Mm. Uh, so, I built thousands of 
you know, PVS 14s and hundreds of dual tubes and, and repaired stuff. And, um, one of the things I, going back to what I said about, I approach things from an aviation mindset. I, I look at, you know, all these components, it's like, this is parts of an aircraft. So, you know, I can, I can troubleshoot faults and stuff like that mm-hmm. by swapping parts. And the guy who managed the program before me was an infantryman doesn't have the same approach mm-hmm. to doing stuff. So we ended up having, you know, boxes and boxes of, of parts that he was like, Oh, these are all bad. I was like, are they? And so when he got laid off and I took over his program, they were like, Sam audit this, like go through all this crap, okay. tabulate, tally up what is good and what is bad. And I went through and I basically audited all this stuff. And I found like $300,000 worth of perfectly, fine. perfectly fine stuff that, and, and, and there were some things that I did because, you know, I can solder things. I, you know, as an electronics repair uh, technician guy in the Navy. So I can do certain things that to, to this stuff that other people couldn't in the company. So I was able to like rehab and refurb, you know, okay. otherwise perfectly good parts into perfectly good working parts. So I saved the company like, you know, over a quarter of a million dollars right, right now. within the per- first 10 days of taking over this program. Yeah, you're, a, um, you're a hero. Oh, Vic DeCosla was like, hell yeah, yeah right. at, on the one hand. And then like, how did I not know yep. this was happening? What else did we, we miss? Like right. how much has gone on on the back end? But ended up straightening out the program, aligned it, got it going and, and ran it for a while. Um, and then, you know, Don got some other offers and he ended up leaving. And I, um, things were ramping up also with Greenline and also with Warrior Poet Society. Yep, we haven't and talked so, about that one yet. And so I kind of throttled back and went to part-time with TMBC. And that was, that. It, and it was like that for about, Eh, two and a half, three years, and that was cool. So while TNVC was kind of on the descent, or at least winding things down, a you know, bit, yeah. a little bit, or at least kind of plateaued on the on the DL, you know, all this other stuff is ramping up. So start helping Don, and um, as Don leaves, because there was a conflict of interest when he worked for TNVC, he's like, I can't teach night vision outside of TNVC. So when he left, he was like, you know. Um, I, he was like, I want you to help me revamp the curriculum because we, there was a lot of issues we saw with the curriculum that TMVC was teaching back, back then. I can't say, speak for what they're teaching nowadays. I would assume it's probably better, Mm -hmm. but anyways, there were some, we call them chip isms, but Chip Lasky, um, he, he worked with us. He now works at unity and chip is still one of our our best buddies, but there were a lot of like chip isms in the curriculum. We're like, do that applies to you chip? That doesn't necessarily apply to all of these people. And it doesn't really have anything to do about night vision. But so what I went in, I don't want to say I gutted, but I, I revamped a lot of the stuff and now we start getting into the technical stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, when I was at TNVC, man, I hit the books. You know, I'm kind of a nerd, you know. I did not know this about you. Right. Like, this is interesting. So I start researching all of these things that are happening in a night vision system, you know, kind of on like the subatomic level, you mm-hmm. know, um, and what is going on with, you know, microchannel plates and how the magic happens and everything like that to, to better break it down and explain it to people. And, um, we incorporated a lot of that because I kept getting questions from people on because I, I would man the, the TMVC hotline. They're like, well, what does this mean? What does that mean? And so a lot of the, the curriculum um, was, input was, was based, was, on, was those based on the feedback I was getting from people. <clears throat> Smart. And people wanted to know this minutia, this night vision nerd stuff. Um, there's a lot of people who are like, oh, I don't need to know that in, in the night vision space. Mm-hmm. And if you don't want to teach it, that's cool. And maybe it's because you don't want to teach it or maybe you don't, you don't know it. it. Right. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I'm not calling anybody out, um, you know, but there are, there is a large demographic of people, military law enforcement and consumers, mostly consumers who want to know this nerd stuff. Okay. And so if you, our night fighter program, which I guess uh, Don would call it our, our flagship product, um, it's kind of my baby. Mm-hmm. The lecture portion is a big, I mean, it's, it's a big part of it. Um, you sat through that like hour long yep. lecture that I, I did, did at, at Atlanta range day. It was awesome. Um, yeah, that was just, that's the, that's the, the, that's that's the just, start. Yeah. yeah. 
that's that's d- dipping your toe into the the shallow end of the pool on that one. Uh, I only have an hour. Some sometimes that lecture lasts eight hours, hmm. and and I don't care. Like I straight up tell the students, I'm like, I'm here to answer every single one of your questions. If you've got a question, you throw your hand up. I, let's not leave any stone unturned. I want you to walk out of here, like with all your questions answered. And I, so far I haven't had a student ask me a question I couldn't answer. Um, right. I'm not saying I know everything because I know more today than I knew two years ago. Sure. And I will probably know more in two years. You know, ago. And, and, and this is part of the learning process. Like, have you ever been somewhere and done something where like you go into, it, you're like, I know I'm, I'm pretty good at this. And then at the end of the thing, yeah. you're like, Oh shit! I don't know shit about this. Uh, yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. yeah, exactly. I, I guess is that the Dunning Kruger yep, kind of thing? Exactly. Yeah. It's just enough to be dangerous, right? Right. Um, so there's there's some some of that going on. But anyway, so we we revamp the curriculum with what we saw at the time, and we hit the road. And night vision, the night fighter program has been, you know, pretty damn successful. Um, borderline, I, I don't want to say highly sought after, but. Um, it's it's definitely unique. It's it's unique, mm-hmm. and we're known for it, and and I'm happy to be known for it. Um, Don's like, oh, you know, we do other things, and he's like, I don't just want to be known for for night vision, and like, I'm like, I got it, dude. Like, give I, the people what would, they want. Though. Yeah, it, it, I would love to be known for all oh. the things, mm-hmm. but you know, I would I'm okay with being known as the night vision guy. And but oh, by the way, I don't have a special operations background, right? So the night vision is where I can really shine. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I think, you know, to Don's credit, he has assembled a great team of people. We got soft guys. Right. We got Rangers and Green Berets. Uh, we've got conventional dudes. We got infantry guys. We've got um, artillery guys. We've got, um, hell, we've got a freaking military policeman on, on, on the on thing. The staff. We've got, you know, SWAT cops and all this stuff. And then we've got me with an aviation background and a real like technical electronics background with, with ISR and, you know, Thermal air crew stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a pretty eclectic mix. And so we're, you know, when you, when you have a bunch of cops say, or a bunch of green berets, mm-hmm. they're going to think and approach things like a green beret. And in a lot of situations, that's great. You could know, be, depends, could be. Depends or, on the goal or the audience or whatever yeah. else. Yeah. But sometimes, you know, Don will be like, hey, let's do this. I'm like, well, what about this? And he's like, hmm, didn't think about that. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. You know, so uh, it's it's good. Uh, uh, it's a good, to Don's credit, he's he's assembled a, a great team. I mean, we got, we've got the best sniper in the world right, right. On, on, on staff. I mean, Eric Vargas is... I guess he's like me when it comes to precision stuff. And, and I equate a lot of the night vision, nerdy technical stuff to precision. So, mm-hmm. so you've gone to a couple of precision classes yep. and there's a lot of minutia uh-huh. and you, you want to know that stuff. Absolutely. You, you want to know what that more information bullet, I have. You know, it's you best for the problem. You'll so, understand the so. re- left and right limits of your gear mm-hmm. and you'll know what that bullet is doing in multiple phases of flight, depending on the environmentals that are mm-hmm. affecting it. And the same thing goes with night vision. You, as as environmentals change, your night vision starts to do certain things. And instead of going, oh my God, it's not working or whatever, you know, like, mm-hmm. oh, it's doing this. And then I can compensate it by doing this or mm-hmm. this or whatever. Um, but anyway, night fighter is, is a, is a, we, we say it's a night vision class. So it's, it's not a fucking carbine class where you put your night vision. Right. On. And I think that's, you know, probably people have walked into that going, cool. I got a class where I can go, right. I can go shoot at night, which is not easy to do. Right. It's, so. it's not. And there are, and I'm not like dog and other people who t- like, dude, Mocha bear. Have you taken his night vision? No, class? I, so I haven't trained with John yet. That's a to. good performance enhancing class. He's going to take you and your gear and get you really good with it. It's not necessarily going to teach you about night vision. Yep, got it. And, and, and I think that's great. That's his curriculum. Because if we were all teaching the same thing, right. it'd be pretty freaking boring. Right. And and I tell people, hey, like after Night Fighter, you want another, like you want a performance enhancer? Go, go see take, that guy. Go, go, go talk to John. I mean, I've taken the class and I had right. a lot of fun and, you know, right. it's, it's awesome. Um, but, but Night Fighter is, it's a data dump. I mean, it's. It's, it's, it's collegiate level stuff. Like I, even my dad, like my dad and I, he doesn't really understand the world I, I come from because mm-hmm. he, they're, 
there are a bunch of, you know, Democrats and, and everything back in, you know, central Texas. But he came out to the lecture portion of Night Fighter. And I never went to college other than the semester. And my oh, dad, interesting. Yeah, my yeah. dad was like, this you know, awesome. he always harped on college education. If you don't have college education, you'll never be successful. Sure. Mm-hmm. And he sat through the lecture portion. He was like, mind blown. How do you know this? Yeah. Like, this is, and my dad's not a night vision guy, nor is he a gun guy, but he was like, God, I thought you had to go to college for this stuff. I was mm-hmm. like, well, there's the internet now, dad. Yeah. I mean, he's like, well, yeah, of course. I'm like, and, and a lot of this stuff we it's teach ex- in the military. Yeah, but it's you know. experiential too. Yeah. So um, he was like, oh, wow, you you really are, you know, a subject matter expert in this stuff. And that was, that was kind of cool. Like, I my, bet. My dad's like, oh, okay, I don't have to worry about you kind of thing. And he, I, he hasn't since I was 18, but I get it. He, he got a little bit of peek in behind the curtain of, of my world. And he was like, oh, okay, this is cool. I'm a dad too. And, so, uh, you know, I'm proud of my daughter. I want her to be proud of me too. So right? you know, I get that. Um, the, one of the things that you guys do also is the night ops summit. Correct. Um, w- yep. Which is a annual thing. Um, I got invited out to it. You guys invited me out last year, um, for this year. And you were like, well, no, the, the, I, <laughs> no, and I knew CRW, going yes, CRW on. was the weekend before right. and it was just going to be, there's going to be no way I could do to do that trip. Um, do that trip is literally like, what's crazy overlap. Yep. is there's a high likelihood Don's doing CRW this next oh, that's year. that's awesome. And then he's going to... He's going to go yeah. back. He's so, going to fly back. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. It would be balls to the wall. Yeah, we um, we had a great time at CRW. But, I, you know, I I I knew I didn't want to stack myself too thin. And I'm, yeah. I'm glad I didn't because when I go to these things, I really want to be all in. I want to completely yeah. be immersed in it. Uh, but it's interesting. Like, when I was back, when I saw you guys out in uh, the Atlanta area, I... There were so many people that came up to me and said, so you come to Night Ops, you come to Night Ops, you got to come to this thing. You gotta. I mean, those people that right. go, they're like, this is like the premier event, you have to come, whatever else. They were doing a really good job of pitching it right. uh, to come out there. And this, I mean, some of the things that people see you doing, and whether that's at this particular um, course or, or anything else, seems like there's a lot of helicopters involved. Uh we, there's we, one. Yeah. I don't say a lot. Well, but, I just mean right. kind of what I see you guys doing, sure. that there's... There's there's some aviation stuff that that's included in. Can can you talk about that? Just give us absolutely. Like, yeah. So, um, Green Line has partnered with Airborne Tactical. We actually have a pretty long storied history with Airborne Tactical. We 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 did, did stuff with them when I was at TNVC. Okay. Um, Paul Barth is the chief pilot and owner of the company. Paul is a phenomenal pilot. Um, he's obviously he's night vision qualified, so he can fly you know, mm-hmm. under nods, which is kind of what we need him for. But, uh, I mean, he can do, do it all, you know, he can sling load stuff. He can, you know, he's got, uh, he's got a camera on the bird. He can oh, do nice. really nice, um, you know, aerial, uh, video and stuff like that. He's, he's done a bunch of commercials for, for big name companies like Nissan and some other, okay. you know, other big name companies. But Paul is, is in terms of, um, Helicopters in the Southeast region, everybody knows who Paul Barth is. Uh, he has a great track record. He doesn't have any like class A mishaps or anything mm-hmm. like that. He's a great pilot. Uh, his crew chief, Angel, is a former 160th SOAR guy. And even Angel's like, Paul's the best pilot I've ever flown with. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so it was it was a easy thing. And actually, Paul reached out to a mutual buddy um, client of ours. And that client was like, Hey, uh, Paul is very interested in, in talking to you and working with you, i.e. Greenline Tactical, about doing some stuff. He's like, he thinks that you have some clientele that might be interested in the stuff that we mm-hmm. could offer as a, as a team. So we we kind of, we, we had some conference calls and, you know, aerial gunnery came up. And so, you know, Don, when he was in the Rangers and, and SF, obviously, he was flying around on little birds mm-hmm. um, and, and, has, has done some of that stuff. And then obviously me with my air crew background, mm-hmm. flying helicopters, you know, I've got some time on H threes and 53s as well, in addition to P three. So I've got kind of the aviation piece covered down. Um, we went down to his hangar and went through his certification program program, okay. um, or a certification program, depending on how I want to think about it. But, yep. um, and then also helped develop some SOPs for what we were going to do. Mm-hmm. There's a bit of flying involved, uh, a bit of static ground training involved, some classroom stuff, uh, emergency procedures, all that stuff. So based on that, I went back and I just started 
designing some curriculum around that. Obviously, Don was was in the mix too. So I say I, we, um, and then our buddy Eric Butler also went through the program. And if if you ever meet Eric, he's he's a good dude. Um, he uh, he's a SWAT cop. Okay. And actually, he was SWAT cop. Now he works for the marshals. Um, but he is he is pretty pretty good le background. Anyway, um, we get it all together. We announce this class. We're going to do it in Central Tennessee. It's going to be a daytime aerial gunnery class. And kind of what I would say separates the Green Line uh, aerial target engagement class from some of the other ones out mm-hmm. there is uh, you are actually riding exterior on the bird, mm-hmm. like on benches. There's a lot of places you could shoot from a helicopter inside the helicopter, mm-hmm. but it's a completely different feeling. You know, you get the rush of the wind and you get the the G-forces as the, the, the bird turns and descends and descends and dives. And, you know, Paul will fly certain profiles that are... Um, I have not seen anybody doing some of the stuff that we do and certainly not at night. Um, and we did a class at the, uh, at, you know, um, tactical response. That was you mm-hmm. know, James Yeager's place. Yeah. Um, is it, what's it called down there? Is it, it tactical response? Yeah. It's yeah. in Camden, Tennessee. And we had access to the whole property. So we had multiple okay. gunnery range. We have cars set up and targets in the cars. We had, you know, targets out in the open. Fun. Um, you know, you're doing orbits. He, Paul can, he can basically slip the helicopter. So he'll cock the nose over and then he'll descend this way. So if you're on the bench, you're actually firing forward because you're moving forward and diving in on these targets. It's wild. It's, it, it was awesome. Fun. Uh, and then, you know, when he banks out this way, if you're on this side of the helicopter, you just lean back yeah, and, and enjoy it. If you're, you're on this side, you're like, Oh, <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not, you know, you're belted in. Yeah, gotcha. Um, but, uh, for most of these folks that they never flown on a helicopter, much less shot a firearm from these helicopters. Let's talk about that. Like who's coming to these, man? Uh, civilians, mostly. So we've had some law enforcement, Mm -hmm. um, because they're, they're thinking about standing up a aerial gunnery program Mm -hmm. in their department, but it's mostly civilians. Yeah. People just coming for an experience. Yeah, exactly. And people are like, Oh, that's not contextually relevant. I was like, you're damn right. It's not, who cares? We're trying to like have some fun, bro. Like after 12 carbine classes, don't you want to do something, get off that flat range and do something new? Yep. Um, and so, you know, that's what it is. Uh, and I love flying. It's yeah. Yeah. every like time, time I get on a helicopter, it's and, and, and the students too, like I'll look over and it's just ear to ear smiles. Right. And I'm like, I get it because I'm smiling too. It's, yeah. it's great. Um, and it's fun. And yeah, I, I love the night vision, you know, night fighter classes, but it's like, Hey, we're going to do another helicopter class. I'm like, am I free? I better be free. Yeah. Oh, well, that's my out. anniversary. Uh, <laughs> um, hey, baby, <laughs> you want to go fly in a helicopter for your anniversary? Right, you know, right. um, but uh, those classes are great, and uh, we even have a night vision version. Obviously, right, right. we've done one of those. We've got another one coming up in like eh, two and a half weeks or so. It's in southern Georgia, and the location is awesome. It is. Um, it's it's on this island in the marshes of. Uh, Coastal oh, Georgia. Cool. It's actually, uh, if you've ever seen that movie, The Town with Ben Affleck, yep. the ending scenes uh, where he's on the dock mm-hmm. by the by the the water is actually filmed on this property. Oh, interesting. Because that shit was supposed to have happened in Boston or something, right? Right. Well, yeah. he fled down to oh, got it. Uh, got Florida it. or whatever, and they filmed it there. He actually has a, a house on the compound in a secluded location. It's like 3,700 acres. Wow. And we have basically carte blanche of the entire facility. The, the owner is he's actually a war poet alumni he's a pretty pretty wealthy guy great guy he's he's a gun dude he's like i want to do hood rat gangster shit i'm like let's do hood rat gangster <laughs> shit whatever you want his man. name coincidentally enough is scott yeah. um and he's like let's do it i'm like okay outstanding this is great um yeah, and i think that's another thing that that happens when you start to provide these different types of experiences as you start to wind up in situations where opportunities can be provided, you know, yep. like that versus, again, the basic pistol carbine stuff or, well, I don't know, maybe call it advanced pistol carbine stuff. Like, at this point, I think, the I've said this many times, but the I think that the training community as a whole is not very big, right? When you look at, there's well, a lot of people doing... It's you know, bigger than it's ever been, but it's still... It's still a smaller yeah. percentage of, you know... Yeah, there's 330 million people yeah, exactly. in the U.S., like... Yeah, there's probably, as far as trainers go, like actual, I would say, 
you know, well-known trainer. Yeah, there's probably less than a hundred, yeah. 150. Tops. And you guys all share, you guys all share the same customer base, right? Pretty much. So you're going to have to have some things over time or you don't have to, uh, but it, you know, diversifying like that, but, and, and I want to get back to this diversity thing in a second, but to diversify that, that is very smart. Again, it provides opportunities for people to do stuff they've never done. Yes. Not everybody's going to be able to afford to do that. Correct. That is capitalism, right? I own a business. I have high ticket items and I have low barrier of entry stuff. I've tried to make it fit everybody's pocketbook. Might not necessarily be for you because of, you know, yeah. maybe you can't afford it. That is what it is. Um, but the, 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 when I when I talk about like the diversity of the team, diversity, what I mean is the diversity of the team. Uh, you mentioned Don and all the characters that are working with and for Greenline. That is pretty rare. Uh, there's been a couple of other companies that have tried uh, to do this and it imploded uh, for probably a few different reasons. And it was likely due to the personalities and disagreements on kind of how principally to handle things. And I'm sure some greed you know, and how to handle money probably probably popped in there. Yeah. This is a company, again, right from the get-go that I saw this happening for that being Greenline. But the interest, the more interesting part, I didn't find out about this later, and I was actually shocked, is the Warrior Poet side of things for you specifically, that you're actually an instructor for them, and you teach quite frequently yeah. for John Level's team. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that happened? That's, well, yeah, so... It's and like, how it works. Yeah, like, so how do you work it, this? It's kind of like you, there's only a couple of trainers out there. So there's, you know, I guess by default, there's some incestuous nature mm -hmm. within the, the training community. Uh, but um, Don used to be a part owner in a company. And when he left, the owner, the new owner or the, the old, other owner had to bring in a an instructor because the, the owner wasn't really a gun guy, a trainer. So he calls his brother-in-law up. Mm -hmm. Guess who his brother-in-law was? John Level. John Level. Got it. So John comes in, and um, this is guy. This is probably almost fifteen years ago. John comes in, and he is uh, John's an interesting character. He uh, obviously he was an Army Ranger. Um, he's a, he, I say successful businessman. Successful businessman now, but you know John. John had some struggles, or like mm -hmm. you know early on uh, after college, he you know he, he had a bunch of failed, uh, small businesses. He did, uh, I, I think he did like, um, like commercial, um, fire suppression system installs, okay. Just like all kinds of stuff that you, you're like, he, wait, he did that. It, yep. But John, John tried to do a lot of, a things. Lot of things and, and failed and, and learned from them and, and took those lessons to heart. Uh, he was a missionary mm -hmm. over in, um, Costa Rica. Right. He, uh, he helped, I wouldn't say he founded and pastored a church. He may have been like an assistant pastor, but you know, he went out and 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 did the missionary thing for years. He's a very religious guy. Yes. Very strong faith. Um and and mm -hmm. it's 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 kind of controversial for some people. Um and on the other side of the coin, like some people love him for that. Mm -hmm. Like you know, it's like everything. You're either gonna love somebody or you're gonna hate somebody. But anyway, um John was looking to come back from the missionary thing and this opportunity to be a firearms instructor kind of plopped in his lap from his brother-in-law. And it's like, well, he's a ranger. He, you know, he mm -hmm. can do the things. Um, and so he came in and I remember uh, I met him. And, and if, if you ever interview him, he'll tell you, he's like, yeah, first time I met Sam Houston. I hated that. Oh, I could, I could totally see that. Right. I don't know. I've never met John. I'd love to sometime. And, and but have, I could imagine there's yeah. a very it's polar opposites. We, we, we have this, like, uh, we have a very, I have a different relationship with John than anybody else in the company. Me too. Like, I can say things to John Lovell that nobody else can say. Like, mm -hmm. I can be like, that's the dumbest shit I've ever heard in my life. And you're he'll an, listen. You're an idiot. I didn't say he'd listen, <laughs> but I could say it. Um, and he'll, he's like, why did I ever hire you? I was yeah. like, because you're a bad businessman. He's like, <laughs> that's yep, the Sam right. I know. You're that's right. the Sam I know right there. Right. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, so John, um, he worked at this other company that Don used to own, did that for a few years. They ended up having a falling out between his brother-in-law and him, which, you know, totally different side story, kind of sad. But uh, John kicks out and starts doing the, the war poet thing. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like one man show for uh, about the first year. And uh, we were hanging out one day at his house when he lived down in Brunswick, Georgia. 
And I was like, uh, and this was back when he was like trying to do like Bitcoin stuff. He was going to make it rich on Bitcoin. Okay. Anyway, um, I'm like, how's the war poet thing going? Mm-hmm. He's like, dude, I am, I'm busy, but I'm killing myself. It's, he's like, I don't know if I can sustain, you know, doing all these classes by himself, moving all the range all equipment, traveling. And, and On the road, yeah. Yeah. I was like, just off cuff comment. I was like, well, if you don't really need help, let me, let me know if I can help you. Cause I was AI for Don and all this mm-hmm. stuff. So about three months later, he calls me. He's like, bro, I need your help. I was like, sure, man. Tell me when and where to be. He's like, can you be in Vegas in, you know, three weeks? This was like, you know, right before Christmas. I was like, yeah, dude, I'll be there for SHOT Show. I was like, I'll just stay a couple extra days and we'll teach. So uh, this is 2017. Did my first couple classes with John officially. Mm-hmm. I had done some unofficial stuff with him mm-hmm. on the range uh, prior to that. But officially, 2017, January. We did our first classes together and John and I were, you know, it was, it was the John show with side act right. Sam mm-hmm. for about uh, three, three, about, about two or three, two and a half, three years. Um, and in that, in an amidst that I actually was, I had joined the, uh, the air guard. Okay. Yep. So I was, I was doing, you know, green line stuff, TNVC stuff. Air guard stuff, war poet stuff. I was busy, busy. Uh, and you know, I was training up for a, a really arduous selection process. You know, working out at least once a day, sometimes twice a day. You know, probably six times a week. Um, you know, and and going to drills and and what are we talking PJ stuff? Uh, TACP. Yeah, gotcha. Um, actually, I went through school with Mike Jones, Grand Thumb. Was that right? Yeah. yeah so, uh, that, you know, Mike's a good dude, and I got to know him. For, I mean, I knew him prior to that, just being in the industry, but right. really got to know him better in, in TACP school. And, and he's a great guy. Like, yes, he he is your your typical he's you know, character. He, he's an influencer. Oh but, yeah. But she's I know him. A lot of I know him like on a different way wavelength, I guess. And great dude, great leader. Great, you know, TACP cool. officer anyway. But uh, so I I had to take a break to go off to school and do this stuff. And I, and I don't actually, mind, I don't mind talking about this. This is one of the, the bigger failures in my life. Um, <laughs> looking back on it, I was like, why did I do that? Um, I decided to go through an, a pretty arduous selection process um, at the ripe old age of 36, 37 mm-hmm. years old. Mm-hmm. Um, and if anybody has been in special operations, you don't see too many guys past Going the through. age of thirty right. attempting that stuff. You know, every once in a while you get some SF guys who are who are doing that stuff. They may have had a prior soft background or whatever, but but it's a young man's game, mm-hmm. and it beat me down. I mean, just the the constant every day. You're up at four a.m. Mm-hmm. You're you're expending anywhere from five to seven thousand calories a mm-hmm. day. Uh, running, rucking, just getting smoked, um, rifle PT, you know, they're, they're screaming at you. So you got that psychological middle game, which old, old guy, whatever, yeah. I can play the game, but physically, the physically, um, yeah. the recovery it, stuff, that's, that's what it was. Like I was, I was stronger than 18 year olds. I mm-hmm. could beat the shit out of them. I could ruck better than them. Um, they could run faster than me. Uh, I just don't have the, the cardiopulmonary capability Mm -hmm. that they do um you know i was running about 25 percent higher towards the red line than they ever were but uh uh eventually it's just my body was like dude your resiliency is a thing yeah Mm -hmm. and and i ended up failing some events and they were like hey man like thanks for thanks for trying Mm -hmm. you it's the reality yeah and and i i said hey man i appreciate the opportunity i had a blast doing this um that's some this good was people. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. And and coincidentally enough, I am still I still maintain some ties with the TACP community. Like when they have night vision questions, they call you. They call me. Yeah. Uh they sent guys to the night op summit for my old unit. Nice. Um, you know, they're bebopping around with their JTAC patches and their their panos and everything. Um, so I get to hang out with my my buddies in the unit from time to time and uh, we still have a great relationship and it, it was a you know, I learned a lot about myself and met some great guys and I'm not bitter about it. Um, but it's, if you want to get into that stuff, you know, do it when you're like 25. Yeah, that's, that's, so. that's the, uh, you know, I, I, 
that's basically the the what I've heard and talked to other guys about too that have maybe gone in a little later. Yeah. There's a there's a mental and emotional maturity 100%. that you have, but that physical piece is you're you're riding on very thin margins there, very thin. And generally, when you're coming in at that age, you already have stuff, right? Right. So you're bringing stuff into it, right? Back they, stuff, knee stuff, you know, ankle stuff, whatever. The Shoulder other stuff. the other thing, um, and it, it was what it was was um, they were revamping the program. So it took me about a year and a half to actually go off to school. So there's mm-hmm. a big train up period where I'm at my guard unit, you know, getting the crap kicked out of you. Um, and the, and the standards were when I originally came in, they were, they were doable. Like I was, I was passing the standards and not just pat, I, like I was, I wouldn't say I was crushing the standards, but I was well. They had a good cushion. Yeah, I had a good, I had good cushion. Like yeah. I was like, I can, I think I can do this. Well, new stuff came down the pipeline and they, they started like, upping the standards to the point where I was like barely this is a stretch. and I was yeah. like, Oh yeah, I'm old. Yeah. Like that was the first time I had yeah. to kind of like understand biology, your mortality. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was a little front. I was like, this, this, this bullshit. Yeah. And like it's, it's life. It's life. Uh, yeah. I had to, had, and it was a good teaching experience, but uh, they, they pulled me aside before I went off to the school. They were like, Hey man, we're looking at your scores and, 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 Bo, oh, by the way, they just upped the, the PT standards again. Just if you didn't know that, they they straight up told me they were like, "You're going to struggle. You're, you're, you're probably not going to pass." Is mm-hmm. what they said. Yep, that's pretty which, real. Which, on the one hand, I'm like, man, why would they they crush you like that? Why? What? But on the other hand, like I appreciate the honesty. They're, yeah, they're respecting yeah. you. Um, yeah. so they were like, just kind of psychologically prepare yourself for what you're about to get into. And so I did, you know, that, that, that could be very yeah. helpful. And right? it was, um, and, <laughs> and so when you go to a job like that and say, you don't make it, uh, through something like that, what'll end up happening, they'll do like a human factors thing. Cause there have been, there have been cases where, where guys will, will join and they'll bank their entire existence on this. They're like, right. I'm going to be a combat controller or, or a CCT, uh, or, or sorry, a, a CRO or, or a PJ or a TACP or whatever. And when they don't make it, they're like, my life's, life's over. over. And they'll, they'll literally go kill themselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, it has happened and it, it's unfortunate. So they, they kind of pull me aside and they're like, Hey, what do you, what do you got going on outside your life? Oh, I was like, Oh, well, I'm an instructor for warrior poets. Uh, yeah. I do this night vision training. I work this night vision. They're like, what? That's awesome. Right. Why the, why like the why fuck are you here? Why are you here? Right. You want to trade jobs? You yeah. know, um, <laughs> kind of thing. They're like, get out of here. Go, yeah. go. And I, you know, so I, I realized a little bit of perspective. I was like, Oh, I'm going to be good. I'm, yeah. I'm cool. It's, it's all good. Life is not so right. bad. Yeah. So, um, my, my, my tech B unit was like, Hey, you should train up for another six months and go reattempt it. Cause I didn't quit. Mm-hmm. They just, and they told me that you're like, you can come back. Um, but I was like, uh, guys, by the time you get me orders, I'll be, I'll be kissing. Close to 40. Yeah. Dude. And like, it was already hard enough. Now I went through in the dead of summer in Texas. That's it, a factor. Yeah. It's definitely a factor, but still, um, I, and I also made a deal with my wife. I was like, this is my one yep. hurrah. I won't, I'm not going to do it again. If I don't make it, I don't make it. So that goes uh, back to the age thing too, right. in terms of where people are in their life, what they can focus on. Yeah. So um, or what they, what they will be focused on outside of there. But you know, like I, I did have a question just jumping back to, to John and Don. Yeah. I, I wonder how that was received. Like how did Don handle you going and saying, Hey, I want to go, I'm going to go help out John. I mean, that, that now they already had a relationship, right? They knew each other. Right. Um, it, uh, I guess, it's a little bit of apprehension at first on Don's part, Mm -hmm. but you know, Don also understood and still understands like, believe it or not, Don and I don't have anything in writing. We are a handshake agreement uh, just between bros. And Mm -hmm. uh, we've been doing this now for almost 10 years and it's never, ever. Okay. Now we do have, we do have an understanding that like, if something happens, this is what you get. This is what I get. But you know, it's we're we're handshake agreement. Yeah. So Don understood, and he and he, he also understood. He's like, I can't employ Sam to the point where he can make a full time living. Right. So he's like, you got to make a living. This is what it so, is. Yep. Yeah, go do the thing with John. And you know, it's like 
the WPS crowd is not pulling from Green Line and vice versa. So he's like, it's okay, it's not really affecting me. Um, that is a unique situation. Exactly. Yeah, if you know anything about, you know, WPS. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. And so I get back from TACP and John, he gives me this like, hey, man, really sorry you didn't make it. But I need you back. <laughs> we got to get back out on the road doing this thing. Let's so, get down to business. Um, yeah, yeah. So we, we, we you know, kicked the, uh, kicked the chocks and, and lit the afterburners and, and, and went, went back and, and did it. And the same thing with Don. Like we yeah. were we went out and, and, and did the thing and, uh, taught classes and, and all that stuff. So, um, you know, with the WPS stuff, it's mostly rifle pistol stuff. I do, I do mm -hmm. one or two other little specialty classes that we teach like once a year or something like that, but it's primarily, you know, very, uh, uh fundamentals centric skills, fundamentals stuff, mechanics mm -hmm. on pistols and rifles. Obviously green line is, I mean, they do that stuff. Yep. But it's really the advanced stuff, so even less of a conflict of interest. Yep. Um, and so it, it it has worked out very well, um, and it's it's cool. There there is the only time it's like hey, I got to tell John, hey, I got this, I got this night op summit. I can't work that week. So right. that's, but it's not it, it it's not really a thing. But you know, if I tallied it up, I probably what is that? probably teaching 120 days a year with warrior poet society like on the range wow yep and then uh probably another 30 to 40 um on the range with don and that doesn't include like travel time right so then you you kick in a couple of days so it's it's probably 180 days a year that's on a lot. the road that's a it's, lot it's almost like being on deployment mm. um again but uh that's that's my life. I love it. I I get that I about you. I will do it until my body physically, can't. you know, can't do it anymore. Um, and you know, you you come from the fitness world, mm -hmm. um, and I understand. You know, in order for you to do something long term like this, which is there's some physicality involved in it. I mean, 100%. it's not. I mean, it's not. It's not crazy, but being on your feet all day hauling some steel here and there, running around with a gun, um, you know, possibly wearing a helmet, maybe some body armor every once in a while. It, it, it'll take its toll on you. And, you know, I have, I, I'm not a gym rat. Um, the gym is not my entire life. Mm -hmm. It is a part of my life. Mm -hmm. And I try and go to the gym and, and not be sedentary so that I can still do this do your kind thing. of stuff. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I heard you said there about the, it's not your life and it, you know, it's, sorry, going back to the, the instruction it's not super physical but yeah you'll say that until one day like right. i'm not saying you as people say that one day until they can't do it and they're like oh shit right this is being taken away from me because you know of a physical you yeah. know thing i mean it's my livelihood yep. and if i can't you know walk around shoot a gun and haul stuff around the range i'm pretty much worthless yep um i actually tore my rotator cuff partial tear um, fortunately it was in such a way that it didn't really affect me, but if it had been a full on tear, um, can't I, work. yeah, I straight up asked Paul Perkerson. I was like, Hey, if would, would I have been able to, he's like, no dude, I'd have had to like sideline you. And right. I was like, Ooh, okay. And so, you know, I, I try to like not do stupid things with my body as much now. Cause it's very adult of you, Sam. Yeah. Like somebody invited me to get static line qualified uh parachute jumping they yeah. have this this thing and i was like oh that sounds, sounds awesome yeah. and then i'm like yeah you like your knees and yeah your back? i'm like no nah, no nah. yeah. as awesome as that would be probably juice ain't worth the squeeze yeah um yeah. risk reward kind of thing but yeah. um you know it and additionally like if i'm going to get up in front of people mm -hmm. whether it's the green line people or mm -hmm you know, warrior poet people and be like, Hey, you want to be a better, like, you know, protector or, mm -hmm. or, 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 um, you know, parent Provi provider, provider mm -hmm. guardian, mm -hmm. um, citizen. It's rooted like, in your health, man. It, dude, if you can't run a quarter mile without gassing out, do you think you're going to, and I'm not even talking about gunfighting. And I talked right. about this. I'm like, dude, you might have to, you might have to do something. Right. They're like, Oh yeah. You might have to sprint to a gunfight. Dude, maybe, but you, 
more than likely it's like it's there's a car on fire and you've got to drag somebody out of a car that's half a mile away or jump over a couple of fences to get a kid out of right. a pool that's drowning. Right. Like how worthless of a human, how worthless of a man are you if you can't do that? Like, or how worthless are you going to feel if you end up in that situation? Yep. And you then you've got to live that. with it. And you're like, yeah. oh yeah, I, 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 I gaffed off my, my mm-hmm. gym time because I like to eat Cheetos and now a kid is dead. I mean, that's 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 putting it maybe a little bit too morbidly, but still, like... No, because when I show up to the range and, you know, if I go out to, to the weekends, I see a lot of stuff out there. It's five monster drinks and, a, you know, and they're all... They're, and these aren't right. the sugar-free kind, right? And it's candy bars and, you know, donuts or whatever they picked up at the Starbucks on the way in. Hey, and all that stuff sometimes is... Like, it's not that yeah. I haven't ever done any of that, right? I'll partake. Or, yeah, but... but- I, you know, I'm thinking a little bit differently about it these days, particularly as we go out. Yeah. I'm still, I want to be able to run a sub eight minute mile yeah. or, 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 you know, pull your deadlift, body weight up, right? You know, or, you know, 25. Yeah, yeah. Pick yeah. up some heavy shit, move it, like carry it. Um, you know, you got to still be able to rotate and move and, you know, you got to be able to slow down or decelerate, you know, under, you know, when you're, when you're moving through stuff. Those are all things that I don't think people, you know, really think about until they're out there and their shooting goes to shit because they're, because their physicality is shit and they get frustrated. And then it's like, well, what piece of equipment is going to gonna fix this for me? Uh, but that said, there's so many guys out there that have really taken responsibility for that. I mean, that's, again, on the fitness side of the house right. for us. Like, I talk to guys all the time and I was, I just saw a few this weekend where, you know, I, I bumped into them and I was like, wow, man, you look fantastic. And I've yeah. been following their journey and, you know, when I say they look fantastic, they're clearly putting in the work. And, it, and that, it takes work. Yeah. Like, I wake up at four in the morning sometimes to go to the gym. Yeah. And I'll be honest. That sucks. I hate waking up yeah. at 4 a.m., but sucks. you know what I hate more than that? Having to use a fucking hand mirror to see my dick. <laughs> yeah, man. You know? I, get it. I don't want. We, no, we've thank gone you. Back, we've, been gone, we've gone back and forth about that a couple times. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, I get you. And it is such a big part of it. Uh, you know, just, again, going back to being a provider, a protector, or, you know, um, as the as the term goes, being an asset, not a liability. Hundred uh, percent. I, I don't know. I don't know what I would do if I had to have somebody pull me out of a situation because I was physically unfit from injured or whatever. I need you to be physically fit because my ass weighs two hundred forty pounds, right? Like I, I'm a heavy dude. That's I, a lot of meat and cheese, right? Exactly, man. So like, I need you to be able to pull me out of of wherever we are. But that's you know whether it's my my truck rolled over on the side of the freeway or. You know, again, like whatever, but um, I mean, things for le- things for people that, to think that about. That shit has happened to yeah, me, yeah. like a lot of car accidents as of lately. Just all kinds of stuff. You do a lot of traveling, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've I've rolled rolled up to many half a dozen car accidents over the last decade. Yeah, you know, and other accidents too. None of them accidents. are good, right? Nope. Some way worse than others. Right? And and so. I'm I'm always the only guy there Give who knows how to do something, who has mm-hmm. a trauma kit, and. Yeah. So, yeah, we're just, that's interesting you brought that up. That being the other side of it is like, what else are you training? We've talked a lot of MVGs and pistol carbine stuff, helicopters. Yep. Uh, but um, yeah, the medical side of things and being prepared there as well. And um, we're actually doing a, um, a collab with uh, my friend Greg Simpson. He's out of Northern California. He's a SWAT medic. He's coming down to the gym to teach a, a full day of, um, of uh, first on the scene, okay. is what it's called. So we'll go through all that stuff. And I was, what what shocked me um, when we put it out there, and I knew I knew people would be into it, but what shocked me is how stoked people were. They're like, Good. this is awesome. Good. Right? Like more people need to do this. And I was like, okay, yeah, that's why, that's why I reached out to him. Like, how do we, how do we do this more? But like, it wasn't, it wasn't like a pistol carving class or an MVG class or whatever else. It was like, hey, they want to know these skills. So you be an asset. Yeah, man. Yeah. And, and the sad truth is like, yeah, medical Ill- a medical car, it's not sexy, like running a carbine or no. pistol or whatever, but you're probably going to use it. Like, I haven't shot anybody in the U.S. Right. Ever, right? And hopefully you won't ever have and to. And hopefully I won't ever have to. But I have had to use my medical training at least a half a dozen times. Mm-hmm. Like, you spend enough time in this world bebopping around, you're going to roll through some shit. Yep. And, you, you know, be that be that asset, not that liability. Right. Like I couldn't imagine like just standing there and be like, no, no, what to do. just call nine one one. And that's not the type of dude I am. <laughs> 10 minutes later. Yeah. So meanwhile, the person is, you know, whatever. Yeah. 
But listen, man, I um, that filled in a lot of gaps for me. Cool, and it makes a, it Good. makes a lot of sense. It, it's I I didn't realize you were such a nerd. And uh, come to Night Fighter, and then you'll be like, "Holy crap, Stephen Hawking got nothing." on I you. actually, <laughs> I actually love that the classroom time. I love being in an environment where I am drinking through a, a fire hose and I'm listening to the other people's questions and being able to take it in, and just be a student um, without expectation of having to know it all. You know, by the by the time we're done, that's actually very intriguing to me, and it's much different. You know, format. There's a couple other guys that do this. Yeah. You know, like it, uh, like just dis- like the distance carving to the PRS stuff, where they stay in the classroom for a very long time, making sure people understand what it is that's going to be happening once they get out there. It's not just, you know, let's just go out there and zero and start shooting away and make a bunch of guesses. Yeah, you, well, guys who do that, they have, they understand human, you know, adult learning theory. That, Yes. You know, you've, and if you don't really understand that, you're like you're probably not going to be a very good instructor. Like I agree, hundred percent. Sometimes you got to see and write and do the th- or see the thing, hear the thing, write the thing before you go do the thing. Hundred percent. And then get feedback from the the coach or whatever. So that yeah, and and for the coaches, they have to see how people are uptaking that information to know, you know, what can they cut out? What do they need to spend more time on? What can they, you know, they speed through? What questions to ask to check for for clarification? Uh, you know, to maintain the quality of what they're doing, also be efficient with with the time that they have. So, and and don't get me wrong, like yeah, well, there's going to be a lecture in Knife Fighter, but we're going to shoot yeah, a thousand yeah. rounds. Yeah, it's, it's, you will shoot. Yeah, it's uh, three days. No, it's, oh, it's, it's two, two days. Two days. Two nights. Yeah, two nights. Yeah, two nights, yeah. Uh, you just have to be. I'll have to get my naps in before because it goes to what like three in the morning. Yeah, we bring out the jet boil, brew some coffee. Nice. Nah, you. Usually, honestly, because we do it uh, during the time change, yeah. um, we're usually done shooting by 1 a.m. So oh, okay. they're not super, super late nights. Okay, cool. But we're, you know, as soon as that sun is down from 6 to about 1 a.m., we're, we're shooting. Cool. So. Well, how do, how do people find out more about you, man, uh, and, and Greenline and what you're doing with WPS? Like, where do you want them to go? What do you want them to know? So uh, if you want to train with me, yeah, obviously, GreenlineTactical.com or WarriorPoetSociety.us. Um, I'm doing the, you know, I'd say probably 90% of the, the rifle pistol stuff I'm covering down on okay. right now. So there's a strong chance you'll you'll probably train with me. Um, if you just want to find me, you know, I have a YouTube channel and um, IG, it's Silent Solutions. Silent Solutions. Um, and then I have a Patreon which is also Patreon, you know, backslash Silent Solutions. If you just search it, it's in there. Some of my stuff um, is behind a paywall because, uh, and I had to put it back there, unfortunately, because um, there's some people in the industry that, like I have been threatened with cease and desist stuff for telling the truth. Hmm. like About product, about, where things come from. Yeah, and t- certain technology or like, Somebody, I don't know who violated an NDA and then told somebody and then they told me or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I have information that maybe I shouldn't have had. Um, so it's behind a paywall. Unfortunately, it's not expensive. But um, if you really want a a deep dive uh, into night vision tube specs, I mean, do some hardware stuff. But uh, I really try to cover down on the on the technical side, not so much the hardware gear side. Yep. Um, Patreon is is there, and then um, additionally, like I'm a student of the gun. Right. Bebop around in this space long enough, I'll probably be on the line with you shooting, yep. you know, to your left or your right. So. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. Yeah, I appreciate how involved you are with everything and and uh, the energy that you bring to the table. I think that's really important. Um, you know, you, you you're a very even keel type of guy. I you get, I know you can be excitable right. uh, sometimes, like any like anybody else, but it's very consistent. And that's what I've gotten from you from the very, very get-go. And I appreciate that. There isn't anything like, I'm not trying to do anything flashy to get attention or, you know, doing anything weird. It's really about giving good information to help people understand so they can make better decisions, whether that be about the equipment they buy or how they use their equipment, whatever else. And really that that's the, that was the, the, the impetus of the show was to have conversations like this so people would have resources. Um, I thought you did an amazing job of kind of walking through that. And the, again, the backstory does provide a lot uh, of uh, like intel to how you got to where you're at and how your brain works um, and the things that you do, which uh, I, I think 
that's an important thing for people to know too, going back to how much they want to know about the, the detail, you know, in the night vision. I, I do believe people are doing a better job at wanting to know where the information is coming from. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, hopefully this helps people understand that a little bit more because, you know, in the world we live in, social media, whatever, you, you know, people can very quickly say they're subject matter experts on something, put a couple of videos together, be really good at editing or whatever else, but the meat and potatoes there just isn't isn't what it what it stacks up to be so. night vision is is one of those areas that uh, it's very technical you know and so you to the layman you only have to know a little to sound like you know a lot right so right. yeah that's a that's a great place place to kind of stop right there so buyer beware <laughs> and uh check out uh check out silent solutions and my buddy sam houston sam Thanks again, man. We'll get you out of here, get you back down to the floor. I know you guys have been real busy this week. A lot of good things happening for you guys. I'll take busy. Busy's yeah, good. All day long. You're cl clearly, like, you're, you're a guy that runs busy all the time. So thanks again, man. Hey, man. Thanks for having me on. This is great. Cool.